Anyway, welcome to this Google Talk. We have Penn Gillette here today. <laughs> you probably know him from uh, Penn and Teller. Been on the uh, David Letterman show, Howard Stern. He's been on a lot of other shows. This is his latest book of the New York Times bestseller list. He did Penn and Teller bullshit. And of course, now it's Penn and Teller fool us, which abbreviates to FU, which is a theme. Uh, he'll be coming out very shortly. We're so happy to have him here. Thank you. How about we give a nice Google round of applause for Ben Gillette? Thanks so much, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. So nice. Thanks for that really nice introduction. That was a great introduction. So, so glad to see you. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my book, about how I lost a wicked lot of weight. And uh, but the first thing I got to say, the most important thing to say to you is, if you take medical advice from a Las Vegas magician, <laughs> you are an asshole and you deserve to die. <laughs> Make that very, very clear. I'm going to be talking about a lot of stuff that I don't know jack shit about. Uh, which is not unusual for me, but I'm going to be talking rather uh, seriously about a lot of weight loss, and these are serious medical things. So really, if anybody's going to listen to a word that I say, you really have to uh, do the research on your own and talk to doctors and people that actually know shit. Um, in uh, 2014, uh, around Halloween time, I ended up in the uh, hospital. I had, um, I had uh, blood pressure like UK voltage. I was really looking at like 220, and that was on five hardcore meds. And um, the doctor said to me that, uh, you know, he had to lose about 30 or 40 pounds. I was about, at that point, I was about, uh, well, you don't weigh yourself at the heaviest. Uh, but I, I figure I, gotta, I, got, I weighed in at about 333. So I think I was probably, uh, heaviest day, probably about 340. I'll give you some advice, anybody here. If you want to lose a lot of weight, first, gain a lot of weight. Because <laughs> if you haven't got 110 pounds to lose, you have not got a chance. Uh, so I was up probably around 340. I don't really know. And uh, I've been told for years that the reason I had... Uh, high blood pressure uh, was that uh, it was genetic. You know, they always said it was genetic. And I do have, um, a, a, in, in my ancestry, I have some of the high risk for high blood pressure um, uh, background. I have a little bit of African and some uh, Native American, and those, those ones that do really bad. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> Sabotaging you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> just, just please go on. No, no, I just want to know. This is exciting. <laughs> I want to know exciting sort of stuff. Are oh, you turning you turn the microphone up a little bit? Trying to. Oh. I don't know if it'll work. Okay, good. You couldn't get your own fucking mic to work, so. <laughs> First, take the log out of your own eye before finding the sty in mine. At least my mic was working somewhat. <laughs> you doing okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we're, 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 it's not like you're invisible. I mean, it's not like you walk like a Warner Brothers cartoon up like this and no one sees you. When you were over there, I wasn't quite... All you thought was misdirecting from you? <laughs> okay. Now, am I louder now? Is that okay? So I have some of those... Um, I have some of those uh, 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 high blood pressure kind of genes. And the nutty thing was the doctor came to me and said that I was going to... Um, they were suggesting that I get my, uh, uh, that I get a uh, uh, stomach sleeve. So they were gonna give me a, a surgical operation to make it so that I couldn't eat as much. And uh, he said he wanted to get me down to about um, 280, so the meds that I was taking. I was taking five medications and at the highest dosage. Um, to get it down, it could be controlled by drugs. And then I said to him, well, you know, what if I got down below that? What if I got down to about, you know, 230 or so? And he said, well, if you got down there, you wouldn't need the meds at all. And I thought that was really odd, because if this was a genetic condition, how could I get rid of a genetic condition just by losing the weight? So I said, the drugs that I'm taking are not really high blood pressure drugs. They're fat fuck drugs, right? I mean, they're just drugs to a fat fuck. That's the reason I'm taking these drugs. Uh, and he said, well, I guess so. I guess you could say that. <laughs> But, you know, you'll never get down, you'll never get down to 230. You know, we're just hoping you'll get down to, two, to 280. And uh, I did not say anything about losing weight when I was in the hospital. As a matter of fact, when he said stomach sleeve, I said, sure, I'll do that in a few months whenever it's right. I can come back in and schedule something, get that operation. Because I didn't want to make any promises in the hospital. Because I do not believe anything 
anyone says in the hospital on New Year's Eve or right after they come. Um, <laughs> and surprisingly, I say the same thing in all three situations. <laughs> um, but, uh, so I didn't promise anything, you know? I just thought, well, maybe I'll see. But what the doctor gave me by saying stomach sleeve, by saying that um, they were gonna do a surgical operation so that I could lose weight, what he said to me had nothing to do with the surgical operation, had nothing to do with the procedure. What it gave me was the liberty to go crazy, the liberty to be a nut. Because what I'd always thought was I was supposed to lose weight like a grown-up, like an adult, like the New York Times wanted me to, or like with slightly smaller portions, and why not be vegan after six, and maybe do a, a, an afternoon fast once in a while. It was all this moderation thing. And as soon as he brought up they were actually gonna do a surgical operation, it gave me license to be crazy, to look around for something nutty to do. And I realized at that moment when he said they were going to actually do a surgery, that I, um, not only am I not good at moderation, it's easy to say that you're not good at moderation, but I also don't respect moderation. As a matter of fact, if you're good at moderation, I don't like you. <laughs> I think you're a boring asshole. Um, the only things we brag about are things that uh, are, do not have to do with moderation. No one brags about taking a casual walk up a grassy slope. They brag about climbing Everest. And I realize that all the people I admire, all the people I look up to, are people who do not do moderation. So I started sniffing around to try to find some way to lose the weight crazy. And so all the stuff they say to insult people who lose a lot of weight quickly, like it's a fad diet or it's this or that, was exactly what I was looking for. I wasn't looking to just do a little bit of something. I was looking to do something really intense. And into my life, uh, not into my life, is he, uh, but uh, a friend of mine showed up again uh, about the day before Thanksgiving. He showed up again. His name is Ray Cronice. I call him Cray Ray because he's nuttier than a shithouse rat. Um, <laughs> And he used to work at uh, NASA. He worked with astronauts. And uh, he's the one that took me up in the uh, vomit comet when I got weightless. So he's always been involved in taking weight away from me. Um, <laughs> and uh, I went to the vomit, well, actually not the real vomit comet. We actually set up what I think now was, a, was an illegal bootleg uh, vomit <laughs> comet. Um, all I know is that on the manifest when we, uh, when we took off, it was an uh, Air Mexicali uh, uh, cargo plane, which doesn't seem too official for NASA. <laughs> and it was at a little kind of stupid airport. And also on the manifest, the two people listed as uh, uh, mission specialists were me and Billy Gibbons, a ZZ Top. <laughs> so uh, we were the brains of the outfit. So uh, when you've got a magician and a blues guitar player together in charge of an aircraft, you know you've got trouble. But we did the, uh, we did the parabolas and did, uh, it went, uh, went weightless for a while. And that was Ray Cronice, who, uh, as a matter of fact, when I was on uh, the Vomit Comet, and when I realized I was going to go weightless, I think I, I share this with everybody. The first thing you think when you're going to be weightless is, boy, if I'm going to be weightless, I have got to strip naked and sing the Barbarella theme. <laughs> Especially if Billy Gibbons is there to play guitar, right? <laughs> because uh, as we all know, Barbarella, the 60s film, Jane Fonda strips naked uh, while weightless. Now she's not actually weightless. I don't see this, here I am, being that skeptic, exploding those myths. She's not actually weightless. She didn't shoot like Apollo 13. You know, she didn't have, she didn't have Ron Howard doing it. She just was on a piece of glass in Hollywood rolling around. But uh, I wanted to see if I could strip naked like Jane Fonda in Zero G. So Billy played guitar and I went, Barbarella, psych. And they're kind of a little bit surprised that I was going to actually strip naked. Uh, but if you look at my resume, I'm not one to bluff. So I <laughs> was not only Zero G, but I was Zero G naked. And then I also, as it's called the Vomit Comet, I also vomited. Uh, <laughs> And at that point, I had hair down my back and curly and messy and zero G. So I not only vomited naked, but also vomited naked into my hair. And uh, 
The person who was videotaping that was my <laughs> buddy Cray Ray, um, Ray Cronies, who also set up the illegal uh, vomit comet thing. Uh, so he came back into my life uh, that uh, Thanksgiving of uh, 2014, and he had been doing about five years of research with a, a bunch of real academic people um, about, uh, about really extreme weight loss. And they discovered a few things that were really, I would say counterintuitive, but I don't think they're counterintuitive. I think they actually are intuitive. They're just kind of counterculture. Um, they found out a few things that the faster you lose weight, the more likely you are to keep it off. And they also found that radical changes in diet were actually easier for people to adhere to than to uh, than moderate ones. And uh, they have been taking people through this um, through this program. He, now, he'd done very few uh, studies at this point. They'd done about three or 400 people they'd put through this. And as we all know statistically, a few hundred people means nothing. So the information that you're getting, what's weird about my book is this, you know, this stupid popular book um, by a comedian came out before the real science studies, which will all be coming out in a year or two because I'm one of the early people doing it. So I actually got out into the forum, into the public eye before the real scientists. So all this stuff will be backed up and then torn apart by peer review after that. Of course, my book is also peer reviewed, but I'm a Vegas performer, so <laughs> my peer is Carrot Top. So, um, <laughs> Carrot Top looked over the science in the book and says it's okay. Uh, but what Ray did for me was he first of all did two weeks on a um, on a mono diet. Now this is why you know when I was on Good Morning America they put you know Penn's potato diet on the Chiron underneath me. It's a little bit of an oversimplification, but a little bit interesting. Um, uh, they put me on a mono diet. Now the mono diet could be anything. The mono diet could be um, you know rice. It could be corn. Uh, could be beans, but we chose potatoes, and we chose potatoes because they're funny. Um, so for two weeks, I ate nothing but potatoes. Um, sweet potatoes, regular potatoes, but not anything added or subtracted, which means not microwaved and cut up so they lose water, and with the, with the, with the uh, skins and everything. I ate potatoes for two weeks. And what that does that's really interesting is uh, it resets uh, a lot of the psychological and physiological parts of eating because it takes away uh, eating as entertainment because eating potatoes is not entertaining. Um, <laughs> it takes away the social aspects of eating because nobody uh, calls you up and goes, hey, Pat, I just got into Vegas. Let's go have a potato. Uh, <laughs> at least it didn't happen to me. And uh, so uh, after two weeks of just potatoes, I had, first of all, lost a huge amount of weight uh, and also felt better. Day three and four are hell because uh, uh, you, get, you get really lethargic and, and sad and have no energy. And then day five, you're just bursting with energy. I mean, I just felt fabulous for the whole rest of the time. The whole rest of the time I lost weight, which was about three months, I lost over 100 pounds. And, um, uh, and then I went to a very limited diet, uh, but not just potatoes. And the first day after my two weeks of uh, potatoes, we had, uh, I had corn on the cob. And the uh, crazy thing was, I've had corn on the cob my whole life, but I had it after two weeks of potatoes. It actually seemed to me like candy. It was just so sweet and so salty and to actually taste food that I eat my whole life, but without the butter, without the salt, without the shit, was just amazing. It tasted so good. And you just had two weeks, just two weeks, you know, just two weeks, no time at all, um, so much of me changed. Foods that I didn't like to eat before, I, I was fine with. Uh, turns out, at least from stuff I've been reading, that all the food we eat is just habit. There's nothing but habit. There's no sort of natural desire. You eat what you were born, born, you know, brought up eating. You know, you grilled cheese sandwiches are comfort food because they were given to you as comfort food, and you got used to it for no other reason. So I ended up after that uh, two weeks, I ended up uh, on the diet I'm on now, which is uh, no animal products. I don't say that I'm vegan because I'm wearing a leather belt, but. <laughs> Uh, I don't eat animal products, no refined grains, 
and extremely low salt, sugar, and fat. And after about three months of that, your microbiome changes and you don't have the cravings. I mean, what I said to Cray Ray was, am I going to be able to eat these foods that I love? Am I going to be able to have pizza and hamburgers and that kind of stuff? And uh, Cray Ray said, well, you know, what really matters about food is what you eat chronically, what you eat daily. Uh, no one gets fat from one meal and no one gets healthy from one meal. So sure, uh, when it's rare and appropriate on special occasions, on holidays or when special friends, you know, <clears throat> eat whatever you want. And I did that, you know, after I hit my target weight, which was on my uh, birthday. Uh, so I, I was in the hospital uh, October 31st, 2014. On March 5th, 2015, I was uh, 229 pounds. Now, from 330 pounds, we, we predicted 229 pounds that we would hit on my birthday. We hit it one day before my birthday to the exact amount, which to me is much more impressive than NASA hitting Jupiter. <laughs> because it's done by an idiot, which you have to, you have to grade on a scale. So, um, and then about two weeks after that, I went out and had a rare appropriate meal and I went and ate everything in the world. I ate french fries and hamburgers and, you know, chocolate desserts and all that stuff. And uh, what amazed me was it was good, but it wasn't like, you know, falling off the wagon. It wasn't like this is the way I was going to eat forever. It wasn't like uh, I had no control over it. It's just like, okay, that's a fine thing. And what's happened is it's now been, and this is important to keep in mind because the magic number on weight loss is two years. Um, two years, uh, you're down to 1% of the people that keep the weight off. Uh, two years is kind of magic in, uh, in weight, loss, uh, weight loss science. And uh, I'm now at uh, 17 months. Um, 17 months, I've kept the weight off. And it doesn't feel like it's going to be back home. I don't want to exhibit too much hubris on this. I'm still careful. But I realize, and this is just the past week, just the past week, um, I realized that uh, I have no more cravings whatsoever uh, for meat at all. Uh, even though I'm, I'm due for a rare and appropriate, I can eat anything I want. The idea of eating chicken is repulsive to me. Uh, fish, I don't want to have at all. Steak and hamburgers went later, but I still have no desire for them. Probably the next time I eat whatever I want, it'll be like a hunk of chocolate, maybe some spaghetti, maybe a cookie. It's, uh, it's gotten so, so easy. And what I found is doing stuff that's really intense and hardcore when you have a real difference in feeling is so much easier than, um, than doing stuff that's half-assed. Also, uh, and nobody knows about this. I mean, so I can talk very freely about this because no one will contradict me because nobody knows jack shit about the microbiome. This is a whole new area of study they'll get to in a while. But it sure seems like after you don't, I'll, I'm going to use some technical terms here, so uh, try to stay with me. After you've not eaten um, meat and stuff for a while, the cooties that live in your guts, uh, that eat meat and fat and that kind of stuff, those cooties, they die. And then the cooties don't send stuff to your brain that makes you crave that. That's the way I understand it. And I know that some of the uh, scientists out are not using the word cooties, but that seems like the exact right word. But there's magic in the microbiome, as far as I can tell. And after you change the way you eat for long enough, uh, things inside you change. So this is what happened to me. And what surprised me probably the most, and the thing I'm, I'm most embarrassed about, about this whole thing, is I am um, I'm an atheist. I'm a hardcore uh, atheist. And I certainly don't believe in a mind-body separation. I certainly don't believe there's any sort of soul or anything supernatural. I believe we are, you know, computers made of meat and nothing more. And, uh, and yet, there was some part of me that seemed to not believe that. Because when I was really fat, um, I really thought there was some like homunculus inside of me that was driving this big fat machine and that my mood and my personality and who I was was somehow different than the body that I carried around. And one of the things that embarrassed me 
and shocked me and surprised me was after I lost 110 pounds, I really was deeply and profoundly happier. And my mood was really better uh, all the time. And I enjoyed things more. And I didn't really, um, I didn't really expect that to be the case. I expected that, you know, when I played with my children, I enjoyed being around my children, and although it took a little more energy to get going, I still wanted to be with them. I didn't expect to be happier and kinder and just nicer. Uh, I mean, not to tell her, but to everyone else. You know? <laughs> um, and it really made this huge difference in my personality. I remembered going back to the, uh, the vomit comet. Uh, what people don't talk about when they're being weightless, you know, when they're doing this, is that in order to do the physics to be weightless, you, uh, when you're doing this, you're at zero G. When you go back up, you're at about two G. And uh, what I remembered from that going on there was you have, when you're doing these things um, physically, and the physics of that are doing that, you also do the same thing emotionally. And there's this nutty thing that happens when you're, uh, when you're on the vomit comet in that um, when you go weightless, you get really, really, really happy. There's a euphoric feeling. Uh, I read before I went on the vomit comet that once you're weightless, you can dream weightless. And I didn't really know what that meant, but there's a feeling I got uh, during those, you know, I did, I guess, 26 30-second moments of, uh, of weightlessness, which I guess if you add that up, it's about 12 minutes. And uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you really feel that, and you can remember it. And sometimes when I'm dreaming now, I dream that I'm floating around, which I never, I never was able to do before, and now I feel that. And a lot of people have talked about that. You know, all the guys that shot, you know, Apollo 13 talked about that feeling of being weightless. But no one had, I'd never seen anybody talk about was the feeling I had, we were going back up. Because at that point, I weighed about 300 pounds. I mean, he's going back up, I weighed 600 pounds. And you do this real uh, incredible mood shift. Because when you go to 600 pounds, uh, the depression that came over me in just that 30 seconds was this huge wave. So you go back and forth from euphoria to depression. So now it's been uh, 17 months. Uh, everything is better for me. Uh, as far as I can tell, there's almost no willpower required. A uh, huge amount of willpower, the two weeks, the potato weeks. Um, a lot of willpower when you first start uh, eating carefully. Uh, but after about uh, five or six months, as you jack into the habit, and as your microbiome changes and all of that, uh, it gets really, really easy. Uh, it's much easier to do stuff that's really, really hard. It was much easier for me to make a major change than a minor change. Now, since uh, I wrote, wrote the book and since I went through this, a lot of my friends came on board. And there's someone that's keeping a, um, a tally. Uh, one of the uh, Penn and Teller um, enthusiasts has been watching people claiming weight loss. So this is the least scientific thing. This is less scientific than the cootie theory. Um, <laughs> because people self-reporting on, on Twitter and an email is no information at all, really, because we don't know, you know, we don't know how many of them are lying. Yes, we do. 100% of them are lying. <laughs> we don't know how much they're lying. Um, but uh, it looks like about uh, 16,000 pounds uh, people have lost, kind of, um, they claim, inspired by what, uh, what Cray Ray has been talking about in this diet and stuff. And uh, it's been, it's been, uh, it's been a really, really wonderful thing. I, know I've, I got a zillion other things to say, but I always like to open up uh, to questions. Anybody has any questions? And also on anything. It can be on anything you want. I mean, you, you can't really be done until I mention Trump, but go ahead. <laughs> How many potatoes? Uh, the question is, how many potatoes did I eat in those two weeks? I didn't keep track, but I started out talking to Cray Ray, going, I mean, I can eat as many, many potatoes as I want? He goes, sure, sure. Many potatoes as you want. I mean, so I'm just going to eat a, a shit ton of potatoes. Well, 
Uh, turns out, even when you throw in sweet potatoes and all kinds of potatoes, um, you get pretty sick of them. By day three or four, I was having like two or three potatoes a day. Uh, first few days was probably five or six. I don't really know how many I ate. I didn't keep track of it. I didn't really intend to document this at all, you know? So I didn't really get on board with the keeping track of this till a little bit too long. Oh, now there's a microphone and everything. Go ahead, ask something. Well, the first question is if the microphone works. I think I got the answer to that one. Sure. Second question is the dedication page of your snazzy new book just has three numbers on it. What are those numbers? Those three numbers are the weights of my wife and my two children. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. I thought this was a book about weight. That's why I should do the dedication. So that's their weight at that time. I believe uh, my wife is lighter and my son and daughter are heavier. But then again, they're 10 and 11. So they, they should be getting heavier. All right. So my question is that uh, I saw the, the, the dramatic change uh, on, on Fool Us. And the, and the first thing that occurred to me was, you know, all the sleight of hand, all that stuff is so practiced. How did that have an effect? Did you have to relearn like where things are in your body? To yes. Learn? Okay. Completely. <laughs> uh, the weird thing, and this is something I was I was so afraid of. Uh, I started out as a juggler, not as a magician. And uh, when I first did all the weight loss, I should also say this is uh, this is a really important thing that I just left off. Uh, during the time I was losing weight, no exercise whatsoever, as little exercise as possible. Um, you want to exercise, you need to exercise, you need to be active, but not until you're at target weight because bodybuilding and losing weight are, are uh, conflict with each other. They're fighting the same things. So I didn't exercise for the whole time I was losing weight, but as soon as I hit target weight, I started exercising again. And what was really interesting about that was that once I started exercising, uh, 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 health and muscle came back so fast, it was just really creepy. I mean, like, three or four weeks of push-ups, and they were just increasing this huge amount. Uh, but the other thing was, when I first hit target weight, uh, I really couldn't juggle for shit. I'd lost all this, the, kind of the muscle memory had kind of changed the different size body. Now that came, very, came back very, very quickly, but it was probably um, a week or two uh, that I had to practice pretty heavily to get back to where I was. Uh, that wasn't so much true for the um, for the uh, minor muscular movements, uh, for the uh, for the um, just hand movements and so on, but certainly for my bass playing, for all the stuff that's kind of big, my voice also changed. Uh, no one seemed to notice it, but when I was doing, uh, I was in the middle of doing a different audio book uh, for a friend of mine, and uh, we went back to do pickups, and couldn't do them. I had absolutely lost my vo lost the voice I had before. Uh, it's hard to describe what I lost. We just lost a different kind of texture. Also, in a movie I was doing at the time, we couldn't go back and do pickups. We had to re-loop the whole scene if we are going to change my voice. Otherwise, you would hear me uh, punching in. Uh, it also changed the way uh, I move on stage, and it changed the way uh, I did comedy. It changed the way I address people. Uh, there was something in... Um, when I was 300 pounds, I mean... Uh, this is a pun, but it's also true. There was a certain kind of gravity in just being able to, to state something standing on stage the size of a doorway. I mean, I'm six foot seven, and when I was, you know, 330 pounds and six foot seven, you're just a presence. You're, you know, you're a, you're a sculpture. You know, you're just this big blob. And uh, I found out that when I was lighter, in order to get the same points across, there was, there was more movement. <laughs> Uh, it was just a different way I stood. Also, we have um, uh, uh, the suits we wear in the show, the Penn and Teller suits, the matching suits, uh, couldn't keep up with my weight loss. We had tailors coming in every couple of weeks, but it was really hard to, to change my clothing. And although uh, when you watch a Penn and Teller show, we hope you're thinking that there are no costume changes, there are actually costume changes on like every single bit. What we do is the, the suit coats we're wearing are gimmicked. Uh, I mean, gimmicked to the tits. Um, <laughs> not just secret pockets, but things that drop things out of, the, out of here and things that drop out of our sleeves and pulls and rubber bands and all this stuff that makes the magic work because we don't really have magic powers. <laughs> so uh, we had to go through and do a, I mean, one of the things uh, when, we, when we're doing our show, uh, we run off stage 
do a complete suit coat change, change our vests, run back on, and the audience just thinks we stepped off to get a drink of water or something. So we do hidden costume changes in our show, and all of that wardrobe had to be changed. Also, uh, if anybody's interested in PR, um, uh, uh, Glenn Alley, who's our manager and PR person standing in the back there, the long-suffering Glenn, Glenn had to go through uh, selling a Broadway show of Penn and Teller when the uh, one of the stars of the Broadway show didn't look like what all the advertising said. So what he actually, it's much more complicated than this, but one of the things that happened on Broadway was when you were going into the theater, all the pictures were Fat Pen because you wanted people to come to see Fat Pen. And when you were leaving the theater, all the pictures were Skinny Pen because that was the pen we wanted you to see in the future. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, they're huge. I was really surprised by the fact that my juggling skills changed and had to be adjusted. And I was also just surprised at how much um, just movement difference and mood difference and all of that. It's, it's a much bigger deal. And of course, some of this, it's not just, it may even be the, the most minor point may be the loss of fat because the lack of salt uh, and oil and, uh, and refined grains in my diet, nobody knows how much change uh, that is, but certainly for my blood pressure, uh, the salt was a, a huge thing, and also changes uh, uh, mucous membranes. So that changes a lot of the voice. The voice change may be more salt than mass. I just don't know. I mean, we don't have enough. We don't have a control group. We don't still have fat pen to compare me to. Um, let me just. <laughs> That's very disconcerting. Um, the uh, so. I just want to say first that your magic acts are indistinguishable from magic. Um, and uh, some of my coworkers are uh, of the opinion that I kind of eat crazy because I eat Soylent. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have an opinion on Soylent? Yeah, I, I was very interested. Before I started this diet, I was fascinated by Soylent. I mean, I always wanted human chow. I always wanted to just be able to, you know, like they have monkey chow. When I even tried eating monkey chow, and then a, a girlfriend said she'd never fuck me again if I ate it again, so I stopped. Um, but, um, yeah, Soylent, um, the only thing I have against Soylent is I just don't trust uh, uh, our science where it is right now. In theory, I think that, uh, that certainly all that could be synthesized and done properly in theory. I just know that... Um, uh, one of the problems, and this is, this is so counter what I would have thought, but my diet before, when I would eat everything, anything I came across, my diet was very, very um, limited. You know, I ate really fat, sugar. Um, you know, there's not any very much difference between a pizza and a hamburger. There's not very much difference between you know brownies and a pizza and a hamburger. You've got all this same, the same stuff going in all the time. What I find now is eating uh, the huge amount of vegetables I eat. And I eat stuff. I mean, I eat the amount I eat now is unbelievable. I mean, the salads I eat are like that big. One of the things is I get bored eating because I'm eating so much. I mean, I just eat forkfuls and forkfuls of salad with just, you know, apple cider vinegar on it, no, no oil, no nothing. And the different kind of food I eat is it's so, so varied that um, I really feel like I'm getting many more nutrients. And I just don't know if, I, if we know enough right now to be able to pick all those nutrients, all those vitamins, put them into something like that. But boy, the idea is seductive, you know, just to, to, to make it simple. I'll also, I need to do this. Um, this is, I probably shouldn't announce this here because I'm not sure of it, but I imagine I'll be winning a Nobel Prize. Um, <laughs> I know, I know, but I, yeah, I'm excited about that. But I, Stockholm is not called yet, but uh, I got the greatest idea human beings ever gotten for a food. And I'm going to give you a recipe. And I can say with great deal of pride that I made this recipe on Dr. Oz's show and damn nearly fucking killed him which would have been a real plus for medical science. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, here's what you want to do. And this is a rich guy. This is rich guy food because it's expensive. But it's so worth it, and you're going to love it. You take blueberries and blackberries. You know those containers like that big? If you buy them at Asshole Foods, they're like, you know, seven bucks or something. <laughs> um, you take like six of those containers. 
maybe eight. I mean, this is this many blueberries and blackberries, that many. And you, uh, you, you wash them off really good in case they've been near Chipotle. And uh, <laughs> you get those really clean and you dry them off a little bit, but leave them a little bit wet, that's okay too. And then you take cayenne pepper. No, oh, no, no, don't you laugh. Oh, when you try this, you'll be so, st feel so stupid for your laugh. <laughs> cayenne pepper, and you put on too much cayenne pepper, and you look down and go, oh, Jesus, that's too much. Then put on more. <laughs> and then you go, oh, fuck, I've lost my mind. It's gonna burn my ass forever. Then a little bit more, okay? Because the best thing is, this will keep your children and Dr. Oz away from it. <laughs> then you take cocoa powder, just Black, really bitter cocoa powder. No sugar, no fat, no nothing in it. Just the raw, bitter cocoa powder. Bitter like a jazz musician at 3 a.m. And uh, you put much too much on there. And then you shake it up. And if you do it naked, it'll look better. You shake it up so you've got cayenne and you've got cocoa and you've got blueberries and blackberries. And you don't do raspberries because raspberries will fuck you. <laughs> raspberries, they get too mushy, and also they get moldy before they really should. So fuck you, raspberries. <laughs> yeah, you taste good, you taste good, but not that good, okay? <laughs> too good looking to be fun to fuck. That's what raspberries are. Um, stay away from the raspberries, fuck them, assholes. Um, but blueberries and blackberries, pretty safe. Pretty safe vegetables, I mean, pretty safe fruits. You mix them up like that, and when you first bite into it, it is fabulous. It is like a uh, flourless chocolate Mexican, well, I mean, rapist, um, uh, <laughs> cake. It's just, uh, it's just the, it's the greatest thing in the world. Now, you're going to say, ha-ha, Penn, that's really stupid. That many blueberries, that much cayenne, that much uh, cocoa. You're going to write me a tweet, I guarantee you, some of you will, saying, you're right. Stockholm should be calling Nobel Prize for these hot, spicy, chocolatey blue. And you'll never even want chocolate cake again. It, this is the thing you'll be craving. I sometimes eat that big bowl of blueberries with cayenne and chocolate like twice a day. It's just, and you feel great, and you can even eat too much of it. So you're too full, and then like in five minutes, you don't feel bad. It's not like eating like four steaks or something. You feel you feel really, really good. So keep that in mind. You don't have to write it down, but make sure when you put the cayenne on, don't be, don't be a wimp about it. A little bit more, and then when you think it's too much, a little bit more again. Someone else have a question? That question, by the way, had nothing to do with the blueberries. I just wanted to bring that up. I'm, I'm pleased to introduce today. I have a mic, working mic now. So oh, go, 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 go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, anyway, thank you very much for coming today. We really appreciate it. Oh, that was it. the last question? Yeah, that was the last okay. question. Thank you very much. Oh, no, he's got you. Oh, go on. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I thought I was, you had one as well. He, he did, but the numbers were kind of out of There's, there's, oh, right there's revolution here. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a time issue and all. Uh, I heard something about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, no, to, to Trump, uh, Trump uh, to, to, the, the rules of Apprentice, yeah. the rules of Celebrity Apprentice are Donald Trump uh, throws off the show anyone he wants to. So there's no way that anything that happens in Celebrity Apprentice can be unfair. Uh, there are no rules to the show. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know, I'm not a good chess player, but I can tell you the rules. I'm not a good poker player, I can't play Texas Hold'em, but I can tell you the rules. Uh, there are no rules to Celebrity Apprentice. A guy just decides who goes home and who stays. So uh, there, anybody who tells you there's something unfair being done. I'll also say, in defense of Celeb Celebrity Apprentice, that, uh, I mean, without getting too Rashomon on this, I believe that it's the, the portrayal of what happens is fairly accurate. I mean, they've got, they've got 12 cameras running you know, 20 hours a day uh, in several different rooms. They can edit anything they want. But the story they tell on that show was consistent with the, with the story I experienced. Uh, there's really all the bullshit and conspiracy things you hear about reality shows are kind of jive. They just kind of, people really are that fucked up and stupid and they just film it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I guess I don't get any more questions. So, good night, drive safely. <laughs>